Okay, I will, I'll go ahead and start. I won't take very long. Um, others can join here in a little bit. I know we have so far, so far 116 are signed on, but we're at least 230 registered. So uh, it's a nice large attendance for, uh, for this education session. And we have a uh, short update from our media chair, Allison. If there she is. Oh, you're on mute. It wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without unmuting myself. <laughs> um, so hi, everyone. I am Allison. I am the 2021 media chair for the Society of Flavor Chemists. Um, and I just have a very quick update. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we are moving to a new format for LinkedIn. Just if you could just let me know if you can see my screen or not. Yep. Okay. So we are closing our LinkedIn group. Um, there are over 3,000 members, which is wonderful, uh, but we are looking for better ways of engaging with everyone, streamlining our communications about events and meetings, um, curating our content, and looking for better ways to engage with everyone that is a current or prospective flavorist. We are going to be migrating to an official LinkedIn company page, which is very exciting because it's just a better platform for us to connect with you all. Anyone can join. It is open, completely open. We plan on sharing curated industry content. Society of Flavor Chemists meeting and event notifications will be posted here. Industry news. It's a wonderful place to network and engage with flavorists. We will be curating job postings and advertisements and also offering giveaways. And here is how you can join. So if you are a member of our current group, you can see on the right-hand side, there is a notification and a link of following the official Society of Flavor Chemists page. You just copy and paste that link into your browser and click follow. So when you copy and paste it into your browser, it will take you to this page and you're gonna click that button where the, um, the yellow arrow is pointing. Super easy. If you're not a member of our current group, all you have to do is go to LinkedIn, search Society of Flavor Chemists and click follow. So I know I mentioned giveaways. So in order to gain some uh, new followers in our new LinkedIn page, we decided to do a fall giveaway. So we will be selecting five people randomly. Um, they will be awarded with official Society of Flavor Chemists branded gear. And the rules are you must be one of the first 200 people to follow our new page. I think we're at about 88 or 89 members already. You must like, comment, or share any of the official Society of Flavor Chemists pages recent posts. And how you do that is right here at the bottom, if you see there's a blue arrow pointing to the like, comment, or share. Super simple. The winners will be selected and announced on the official Society of Flavors MS LinkedIn page. And you will be contacted by me uh, to provide a ship to address to receive your prize. If there are any questions, comments, or feedback, please feel free to reach out to me. It's media at flavorchemist.org. And this is going to be a very fluid thing. So thank you for your flexibility. And we look forward to seeing you on our new page. That looks good, Allison. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, great job. She's done, uh, she's done fabulous with uh, getting this to work a little bit better. And yep. it looks great. We look forward to seeing you. Okay, uh, we will go ahead and start. I'm not going to read Gary's full 51 plus year bio. <laughs> I think everyone uh, here, at least uh, in the flavor circle as well, 
uh, well versed with uh, Gary's work. So um, he is just going to do a quick review and update on flavor encapsulation research. And uh, we'll let him kick it off. Okay. Well, let's see if we can do the screen sharing here. Okay. I don't think that worked. Did it? Let me try again. I'll screen two, that should have. What what do you see? Uh, your topics. This one? Uh -oh. Yep, encapsulation spray drying. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's go ahead and, and see what happens. We can go ahead and put it into uh, this view. How about how about now? We're okay? Okay, good. I didn't want it to disappear when I did that, <laughs> which it some, sometimes does. Well, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you. It's, it's, um, it's always a pleasure. I tend to learn a great deal more when I chat with you guys than I do anybody else. So anyway, <laughs> it's a, a good opportunity here. Um, you know, my title was more or less encapsulation, but in, in fact, that, that tends to be spray drying. If we look at the industry, you can pick a number 85, 90% somewhat of, uh, of the encapsulated flavors are produced by spray drying. They certainly are the, the number one process to, to be considered. And as was mentioned, I really want to do a, a quick overview of past learnings. Uh, this is certainly going to be review for you, for many of you, but I hope you find actually more of the ending about current knowledge and future exploration. I, I hope that kind of gets uh, gets you interested if, uh, if the first part seems like a review. So here's our review. <laughs> um, so this is a, a diagram of a, of a typical spray dryer. Uh, over here, you've got a mixing tank and that's, that's done in, in various ways, but that's where you put your water, your emulsifier, your more or less bulk materials, carrier materials and flavor. You need some kind of a shear to make a coarse emulsion. I don't know about the paddle as it shows here, but anyway, you want a coarse emulsion here and then you'll put it through some kind of a high shear mixer. This looks like a piston homogenizer, but it certainly can be other types as well. So we want to make a coarse emulsion. Typically we want to make a fine emulsion and we want to pump it to the top of the spray dryer. We've got hot air coming in concurrently with this. This shows a rotary wheel up here. So we're pumping that emulsion just off center of the rotary wheel, it sprays out to the side and dries as it falls through the system. Cyclone collection, sifter, collecting powder over here. Exhaust fan not going out to the outside directly anymore. It has to be cleaned up typically one way or another uh, to clean any powder out of it and oftentimes the uh, aroma. Um, I, I love the fragrance of your flavor company and being around them, but maybe if you're doing it 24 hours a day because you're the neighbor, maybe, maybe they're not so happy with you. But anyway, so this are what I call typical operating uh, parameters. In feed material uh, typically runs 35 to 65% solids. By that, I'm, I'm not counting the flavor in that, but that's what I'm gonna dissolve first. I'm gonna put my carrier materials, whether it's a gum acacia, maltodextrin, whatever. I'm gonna put that into water and I'm gonna have just water and my solids. In this, in this window. And obviously I like to work towards the higher end of that window. You don't make money drying water. So let's, uh, let's not use any more than we have to. And there are some comments I'm gonna talk about in, in atomization a little bit later on. So let's maybe won't go here. Homogenization, I generally say it's essential. If you have a completely water soluble flavor, there's nothing in there that's water insoluble. There's no point of homogenization but most flavors have some materials that are not water soluble and okay, then we need to, like I say, do that homogenization. Trier temperatures uh, typically can range from 120 to 315. 
uh, outlet, 65 to 110. And of course, we're not up at the extremes most commonly, running normally someplace around 180 to 200 and probably staying around 80 to 100 as exit air. Atomization, oh, I got a little asterisk there to remind me to stop, right? There are low temperature dryers, they, they fascinate me, where you might be spray drying around 50, 60 degrees centigrade. Um, okay, that's, that's really a different ball game. I think about what kind of capacity they get, and I, I think that would be one of the, the limitations of the, something that low. But anyway, uh, there are low temperature dryers out there which have some advantages. The atomization, uh, disc or nozzle, but be curious if any of you are using two fluid atomizations. Um, maybe send me a note or something if you are, because by far my familiarity is with discs, spinning discs or spray pressure nozzles, spray nozzles. I am gonna come back to the uh, two fluid nozzle though, more or less at the end in terms of interest for future. And what do we really worry about when we do this uh, spray drying process? Well, number one, <laughs> we're trying to protect our volatiles, right? So, okay, we want to retain volatiles during the drying process. So we set things up to do our best job of retaining these volatile materials. Many of our flavors do contain uh, oxidizable materials. That may be a citrus oil, an essential oil of some kind. That's most, most common. And so we're oftentimes concerned about oxidation. And we also are concerned about a loss of uh, specific flavor compounds during storage. And that might be a migration out of the particle, so your flavor is really not retained in it. Or that can be a reaction with the flavor carrier system itself. And again, I'm going to spend a little more time explaining what I mean there. Retention of volatiles, what, how do we manage that? So we got the three goals, retaining, of course, then inhibiting oxidation and so on. So what do we go for? What kind of operating conditions do we look for when we're concerned about retaining volatiles? High infeed solids. And again, that's something we often push. We push to their absolute limit. Um, we're limited in, in feed solids typically are by our ability to atomize the material. And so that gets us into what's the viscosity of the material and what's the surface tension. Can we break these, this emulsion into droplets? Small bean particle size, in this case, I'm talking about the emulsion. We typically want what I call a good emulsion. And that's running around one micron maybe a slightly larger, not, not much. You want to stay less than two microns as a mean particle size. So we want a, a good emulsifier and we want a good homogenizer. We actually need both of those two. Lower dryer temperatures do give us better retention, but in my opinion, most of the time, the cost and lost production isn't worth uh, what you save in terms of volatile retention. So we did a little, couple percent better retention, but it costs us how much? So I don't do too much with that one. I stay in the region that's, that's pretty manageable. Like I say, that's the 180 to 200 and someplace around 80 to 100 coming out. You've got flexibility on both sides though. And of course, one thing that determines your retention is the compound or the compounds that you actually want to retain. Uh, I think we can all tell stories trying to maintain acetaldehyde or something or some very volatile materials. That's, that's a tough game. And so your highly volatile materials are always a problem and they're always influenced the most by the parameters that, that you choose in terms of setting up the dryer. Limiting oxidation, so that's kind of our, our second concern. Um, Basically, what we're depending upon is we're depending upon that particle having barrier properties to the migration of oxygen. So we really want that matrix, that carrier material, to form a barrier so oxygen is not going to treat the particle and, of course, oxidize our, our material. The last one is something that you, you may not think about quite as much as uh, that we do. <laughs> I say we because um, we're more and more interested in proteins these days. Everybody wants protein and everything. So it's pretty much a, 
a hot topic. So anyway, when I, we start looking at this idea, reactions with the flavor system, uh, there is a desire to use proteins as a component of the carrier system. Why? Well, <laughs> what do you want? Do you want something that's natural, friendly? You know, proteins, they're natural, friendly. People say, wonderful. If you put on, I have some emulsifier in there, chemically modified uh, something or other, that doesn't sit so well on the label. And so protein kind of has a nice um, ring to it in terms of serving as an emulsifier for your system. But if you're uh, in this business, uh, I'm, you're, see, you're really feeling a pinch in terms of supply chain. I kind of hear from, from colleagues every now and then about I can't get this emulsifier, I can't get this modified uh, starch sometimes and it's on down the line. It's, um, or materials, actually raw materials for the flavors themselves. I, I think <laughs> I could listen to a, a, a good deal from you guys about how you're suffering in terms of supply chain. So, but proteins are around. Some of these other materials are getting a little harder to find. But if you're, no matter what you're using, I say you stick with low levels of those emulsifying materials, whether it's protein, whether it's a modified starch, agama acacia, they're expensive. You pay for them. And they always bring some level of viscosity. Some materials bring more viscosity than others. As you look at more and more viscous carrier materials, you're looking at lower and lower solids. You're looking at paid into dry water. Again, we really are not thrilled with very viscous materials. It's kind of interesting to me that we do see publications on using uh, protein. And many of the publications in the literature show up papers with 100% protein, not, not low levels. And again, I'd, I'd appreciate your, your feedback, <laughs> maybe offline if uh, you want about what you think about some of this, but uh, protein is expensive. And in my opinion, we want to keep that low. We want to keep that five, 10% in that ballpark. And so what we're sometimes getting or often getting in the literature is not the information I say we need. We want people to work with systems that are economical, that typically that will include some maltodextrin and um, okay, and a small amount of protein, not, not a ton of it. We also have to be aware and maybe are less, think less about this one, but we will get some losses of carbonyl compounds, such as of course our, our favorite benzaldehyde there, hexanal, citral for a little lemon and so on during storage. And so these, these materials, will react with proteins if that protein is in your carrier system. The reaction will be slow, but nevertheless, it does, it does happen. This is a publication I, I hope you've all read a long time ago. <laughs> it was 2009, it was a, a grad student, uh, uh, Josephine Sharp, that did the work, and so it has, has been published. But I just kind of would want to remind you of that. Uh, we do get losses of some material, when we get uh, into shelf life, into storage. And so I've just selected a couple volatiles from that paper. And one is when we spray dry citral and we put it into uh, shelf life, but we do adjust the water activity to 0.33. That's higher than you're going to be. And so I, we, we stress it. We want to put where we get some data in a reasonable amount of time. So. We, in long enough time, if we had a lot of lower water activities, we'd, we'd find a similar line, but it, let's just say the longer time frame. So don't be depressed by seven days or 14 or 21, 28. You're not going to be selling your product at 0.33. And you hope it doesn't go into a food that gets in that ballpark. But you kind of look at this and citral. What was the best material, the best carrier material? Uh, was gum acacia. And these happen to be all gum acacia, all modified starch for a particular reason. And these are proteins down here. So gum acacia really gave us the best retention of citral in storage after spray drying. Modified starch was number two. And then here's our three proteins down here. And so they just kind of drop right out or our citral drops out fairly quickly because of a reaction with the citral. And those three proteins, I think I mentioned whey, sodium caseinate, and soy. So 
three fairly common materials. So that's citral. Modified starch, gum acacia. Well, modified starch is marginally better than gum acacia. I'm sorry, better than the proteins, but gum acacia looks best. If we just pick one other paper from that, uh, or one other figure from that paper, let's look at uh, limonene. How did limonene fare during storage? Well, the relationship is exactly the opposite. How's, how's that? Here's our proteins up on top. They're absolutely wonderful in maintaining limonene. And where gum acacia kind of drops a, a little lower, modified starch the lowest. So why is this reverse? Why did we find citrel not being retained very well in, in shelf life, but limonene is? And of course, it's a different mechanism. Citral reacts with the protein and goes away. That's therefore, you don't have protein in the system. It'd be unwise to have protein in your carrier system. If you were gonna be doing something that has a carbonyl, it's an important flavor compound. Limonene, that, that's not chemically reactive. That's very inert. It does oxidize though. And so proteins show themselves off as being wonderful in terms of keeping oxygen away from the limonene. And so, you know, what's, what's your flavor? I guess that's, that's my story. What do you need to protect? If you've got carbonyls in there, you can be in, in trouble. If you don't have carbonyls, you're not so much trouble. You can use different materials. I am gonna focus to some extent on oxidation though. And so let's spend a little bit of time there. This is my spray dried uh, flavor droplet. That's my powder particle. And of course, it never never looks that nice. Uh, I, I should make it pretty ugly, but anyway, they never turn out exactly spherical. But I, I'd like to think about this particle. So here's the surface of the spray dried powder particle. And this is kind of a bulk material. This is the majority of your carrier. And then around here is what in that wall material, that carrier material, is surface active that really wants to go to the particle, the flavor particle surface. It's really have three barriers. And this surface is different than the bulk. This material is different than the material that's on the surface. As water is evaporating, water brings water soluble materials to the surface. So this surface is different than this. So I do look at it as three different materials, three different potential barriers. And it's interesting, every year we do see a number of publications on the effect of bulk matrix. Again, you go into uh, what's being published these days and oftentimes they are using proteins. I can't say that they're choosing the proteins um, and I'll, I'll make this generalization, there are, there are exceptions, but very often the researchers that are doing that are picking a, a protein that maybe isn't the best choice for some types of flavors, will be chemically reactive. I am going to present a, a, a paper at FlavorCon. Uh, one of the, the guests uh, here today are watching the program is his uh, co-author of that work. So talk about FlavorCon and, and talk about proteins there. So this idea is we're going to spend more, more time with it. You know, we can use proteins for triglycerides. I don't say it's economical, but we can use proteins, 100% proteins for triglycerides, but I would be really reluctant to do that for flavoring compounds, just because of reaction cost and, and so on. And this is the article that I said about showing how we lose flavors once they're spray dried. We have a, a number of operating parameters, manufacturing parameters, that will influence oxidation. And hopefully you've all read this at one time or another. So it's kind of a quick, a quick one. In feed solids, emulsion particle size, powder particle size, spray dryer temperatures, flavor load and water activity. And again, you're gonna get a, a real quick rundown on, on these. This is a, looking at the emulsion size. So it's the emulsion going into the spray dryer. You've got your carrier, you have your water, you've got your flavor in there, and you should have made an emulsion out of it. It's interesting that the finest emulsion gave us the lowest rate of oxidation. 
If we get into, well, this is very fine. That was actually less than one micron, mean particle size. Here we're closer to two, and then we get bigger and bigger as we go up to coarse emulsion. So the coarse emulsion was least stable. That's a little bit contrary to expectations in the sense that a very fine emulsion, very fine droplets have tremendous particle surface areas. There just should be lots of opportunity for the oxygen to enter that, that particle. And yet it's kind of the other way around. Larger particles you'd think would be better, fine, worse, it is, that just isn't the case. I don't remember that we actually did surface soil on these materials. And coarse emulsions typically have more surface soil. And of course, surface oil has absolutely no protection against oxidation. So we might have missed the boat in not measuring surface oil on these materials. That's about the only explanation I have. And I hope in the question and answer section, you say, Gary, no, I got a better solution for you, okay? <laughs> so let's, let's take a look. So emulsion size. Powder particle size. Again, the studies that have been done in that in uh, Japan, they, they, had a group there that was really doing good research in this area. I don't know if they're still in business anymore, but they've shown a nice relationship between powder particle size and oxidation of orange oil. In this case, larger particles, now I'm talking about the powder particle, not the oil droplet particle. Before, remember, I was talking about the oil droplet particle. Larger powder particles are more stable and they do have less surface area. And that seems to come through in this case and giving more protection. Flavor load, I know people used to say, you know, can you just kind of double your flavor load so I have to buy, or I can buy half as much from you? Uh, I'm, I don't know what you say to that. I kind of say, well, I don't know if that's a good idea, really. <laughs> um, this uh, plot here shows there's uh, here's our 20% flavor load, 35, and this is oxidation, limonene oxide. So they're kind of the same. Maybe if we extended this out more, we'd, we'd find that, that these digress more. So, but in a short term, there is a great deal of difference in shelf life between a 20 and a 35% load. But if somebody says, you know, why don't you up that to 50%, I, I wish you good luck with that. So it's just too much flavor, too much surface, too much opportunity for flavor loss. This is uh, looking at in-feed solids level. I said use high solids. I want to use high solids because it makes me money. I don't pay so much to drive. But there's also a benefit in terms of the higher the solids, the better the stability, oxidative stability. So this is modified starch, 10% carrier solids going into the spray dryer. You'd have to be crazy to, of course, spray dry it at that level. Here's 40% modified starch going into the spray dryer. Rate of oxidation, not quite half, but almost half of what it was when we were going in at lower solids. So it's kind of nice. Nature was good to us in this case. Most often, you know, nature does it the other way around. For the most economical is the worst. <laughs> in this case, nature was on our side. This is more economical and it gives us better stability. And that's true whether you're looking at gum acacia, 40% solids here, 10% solids here, or modified starch. Increase that solids level. Water activity. Um, one thing you do have to keep in mind is that everything we publish, uh, we've adjusted the water activity, our powder to 0.33 water activity. At that point, it's still physically stable, but it's stressed. It's really stressed. So water activity does have a strong effect upon shelf life. And generally, the lower the water activity, the better you are. But we will always bring this up to 0.33. So we don't have to wait a year for results. How's that? <laughs> we can get results in, in a month or two. And so you will notice that in our publication. So the lower the moisture content, typically the more stable the system will be in terms of oxidation. Wall materials, wall material effect, emphasis on recent work. The wall material choice influences the particle surface. As I said, the surface of the droplet, the permeability of oxygen 
to the droplet and the barrier at the droplet surface. So wall material is gonna determine the properties of all of these barriers. Our common wall materials, gum acacias, chemically modified starches, maltodextrins, corn syrup solids. Like I say, we occasionally see sodium caseinate, gelatin, white protein, soy coming through. But again, there'd have to be some really compelling reason for using these materials and, and use with caution. They, they may well work in an application. They may be good in an application. But believe me, I would approach it with a good deal of, of care and testing. In my, in my view, our most common carrier systems today are blends of gum acacia or chemically modified starch with a higher DE maltodextrin. And I see people using anywhere from 10 to 30% of the emulsifying carrier, 10 to 30% of gum acacia or modified starch, 70 to 90% of a 15 to 19 DE. And this is a, a good place to start. That doesn't mean that's where you end. If you can be cutting this emulsifying carrier down some and upping this level, you're saving money. And so again, you look at optimi optimizing the formulation, gaining experience. What will work for you? I say the more you can cut down this one, the better your costs end up being. You know, the, so the idea of how does this carrier influence oxidation? What has me interested at the, the, the moment is the third one down here, kind of the barrier properties at the oil droplet. This is probably more interesting to me at the moment. But there's really been a fair amount of literature looking at permeability of the bulk phase. So doing measurements here, can we look at oxygen migration? Can we measure transmission of oxygen through that bulk material? And again, these are the materials I mentioned before, common ones used in the industry. And, you know, we look at how oxygen gets through or penetrates a particle, moves that particle to the oil droplets. Well, it, it's a Fickian diffusion and Fickian diffusion depends upon there being voids in our matrix. And this is an example here. Well, perhaps that's a chemically modified starch or a fairly long maltodextrin chain, but they don't pack together perfectly. They, these polymers don't, uh, form the, the totally solid matrix, there are holes, there are voids. And if that void's big enough, oxygen can come in, there's a little bit of mobility to this and hop here, hop again to the next void and hop again next void to reach your, your oil droplet. So there's been a lot of work looking at, at this aspect and drawing relationships between measuring these voids and then predicting shelf life. So this has been a tool that, that's found fairly common, common use. Um, okay, the void here, well, this is showing you one nanometer in size. So you can see the size of that void. It's extremely small. And there's a technique, positron annihilation lifetime spectroscopy, uh, easier said as PALS, that is uh, available to measure those voids in a carrier material after spray drying. Now, Furmanish did uh, a couple publications, or well, this is one publication, I should say. I, mean, I took two figures from it, two, two figures that I, I really like. And what this is looking at is diffusion uh, over here. So it's oxygen diffusion, uh, rate of diffusion is going up. And this is one over molecular weight of your carrier material your matrix material. And so if it's one over, the bigger this number, the smaller the molecular weight, the average molecular weight of your carrier material. And going this direction, we're looking at larger and larger polymers. Maybe we got a 5 dE maltodextrin out here, 10 dE here, 15, a 20 here. And so this really shows a, a nice relationship that I buy, buy into. The smaller the mean particle size of your carrier material, that's molecular weight, the lower the diffusion. Does that translate into shelf life? And again, they showed very nicely. Here's the shelf life now plotted against that same variable. So if you're using small molecules, you're working smaller molecules in there, 
such as, like I say, a higher DE maltodextrin, you're doing a good job of inhibiting or slowing down oxidation. And that translates really nicely into shelf life. There is, there is a, a side of effect that I, I want to be a, a little bit cautious about. As I said, there's a, a good deal of work that's been published on there. And some of it's uh, published and some is like I say, it's been, been odd published, but it's been for modified starch systems only. That's carrier systems with modified starch. It does not include any data from gum acacia. And I, I was absolutely dumbfounded by that when I started looking at the literature, looking at publications, whether you were in Europe, uh, you know, Germany, or whether you were in Switzerland, or whether you were in the US, every study that's been reported on this relationship between this whole size and shelf life was done on modified starch. There's been nothing done or published on gum acacia systems. And that kind of got our, um, let's not say ourselves wondering about that uh, because we just finished the study oh, a year ago, something like that. And we found there was a range in whole sizes for gum acacia, but the range in whole sizes did not plot with shelf life. So this shelf life idea in PALS data is wonderful for modified starch, but it doesn't seem to predict oxidative stability of gum acacia systems. And so we, in my opinion, and this is one of the things I think needs a little bit of work, is maybe gum acacia protects at the oil droplet interface. Modified starch may protect in the bulk liquid, the bulk matrix. Uh, so these, if there's no holes in the modified starch, it can't migrate through the bulk material. Maybe for gum acacia, I can say it protects at the interface instead. And so it's, it's interesting. Uh, one has to kind of keep in mind too, though, that the gum acacia systems do have small void volumes, though inherently they're small. And so it, we, got, we got a question, in my opinion, needs to be answered to know which way is the best way to go when we work with gum acacia versus modified starches. Now, let's see. I think I just covered that whole thing uh, ahead of myself. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's not go, go into that anymore. But uh, future work, you know, where, where do I see opportunities? Where would I just love, love to be working? Uh, granulation interests me. Uh, probably many of you guys do granulation already. Uh, there's been, a, I know, some patents uh, on that area. But it's always interesting to do it as an academic and say, okay, how, how does this work? And we really did a fairly detailed study looking at uh, flavor retention, volatile retention, and oxidative stability. And generally, I'm surprised, pleasantly surprised with the results. We've kind of done one more experiment, and that's currently being analyzed right now. Then we hope to get this out in, into print. Um, it's a nice way of getting big particles, high dense particles, and uh, like I say, it seems to do a, a good job in terms of retention and oxidative stability. I'm interested in looking at other proteins as an emulsifier in place of gum acacia, modified starch. Again, we're looking more and more at proteins and trying to characterize them and say what's reactive with flavors and what proteins aren't reactive with flavors. If a customer comes to you and says, gee, we've got this wonderful pea protein beverage, is pea prone protein gonna suck up your flavor? Would they be better off using an oat protein, a wheat protein, something else? So we're interested in looking at other proteins. What are the best emulsifiers we can buy at the lowest level? And what's going to be least reactive with your flavor? The market isn't particularly happy with, um, well, I was going to say unnatural, but that's not quite the right word. They, they want everything natural, and that does put some restrictions on modified starches. We would like to determine what does determine the oxygen barrier properties of gum acacia. Is it the inherent small hole size in the gum or is it the interface? If the gum interface with the droplet would be important, then I want to know what's at that interface. 
maybe I can selectively bleed for that interface material. Maybe we can isolate that material. Maybe we can use like a half a percent of gamma casia if we can get the right material from gamma casia. And so I find that as an absolutely interesting one. What can be done here? Type of atomization. I think I've got one more slide and then we're done with that. And that's about two fluid atomization. And, and I hope you will comment or send me a note or send me my email, that's on the front slide, whether or not you use two fluid atomization. Because that's, that's interesting. Mechanical engineering department came over. They, they do a lot in atomization. And they say they've got a system that can deal with very viscous materials. We gave them a bunch of uh, gum acacia said, go for it. And uh, they're, they're quite positive about this. And again, if we can atomize the material at high viscosity, okay, we're gonna be saving money on drier output and certainly cost just in terms of you know, gas and heat and so on. And so I'm really interested in that one. Uh, we've been under COVID, which doesn't permit anybody to come in the building, we, they do now, but I'm really wanting to get them over and take a look at it. Because it, the idea of two fluid atomization, uh, there may be good reasons why it's not used, but one of the mechanisms for the loss of flavor during spray drying is that atomization step. The atomizer rips your, your liquid stream apart and actually lip, rips flavor droplets apart and they're exposed to the drying air. And so this atomization process, very rigorous, high stress, high shear, does expose the flavor to a loss. Two fluid would not have the shear to do that. Two fluid could give better flavor retention. So will it go anywhere? Uh, will it work for us? I don't know, but I'm sure as heck interested in it, both from a better saving in terms of um, drier throughput, like say higher solids. And I'm also then interested in, do we get better retention of flavors if a two fluid atomizer? Well. That's all I, I have. I ran through that fairly quickly because it's probably a review for many of you, at least I hope it is. Um, I'm available for questions and uh, there is an email address on the front. Send me a question if you've got any question anytime. Um, I, I enjoy it. So anyway, thank you. Thanks, Gary. There any any questions? Uh, I'll just make a comment on that two fluid atomizer point. Um, yeah. A lot of the literature will actually be for two fluid atomizers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Most lab dryers, say your Bukies uh, or lab plant, whatever it is, those are generally equipped with the two fluid. So it would be sort of interesting to see, look at like the data coming out of a lot of those and compare it to your own generated data on the uh, rotary disk. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the problem that the Buki is a, it's a, a very small dryer and you can't even go in with a, a high solids mixture, you know, like we do in, in real spray drying. So I'd have to have a spray dryer that kind of reproduces the, you know, the structure, the size, the scale, and, and so. But um, what I want to do is put a two fluid atomizer in our APV and see what happens. Fair. Any other comments? Uh, I just have a comment actually, and Gary, thank you for your presentation. It was actually really interesting. Um, I think my one comment is about when you're talking about um, encapsulating with different things like multidextrin or say like proteins. I mean, from my point of view, um, obviously protein is, um, you know, from a nutritional point of view is very beneficial and a lot of products are looking to uh, maximize that where possible. Um, so certainly from my point of view, uh, proteins for all the cost that they bring to the formulations, um, you know, would definitely be interesting if you can marry that with a good um, flavor as well. Yeah. 
No, I agree, but flavors are typically going to be used at pretty low levels. And I don't know if they would influence your, your label in, in that sense, and they may cost you more troubles than, than they're worth. Uh, but we're not giving up on them and they're not quitting them, so we're in your corner there. <laughs> Uh, just just a comment about the spray drying uh, atomizer. Uh, have you tried any ultrasonic uh, atomizer for high viscose material? No, no. You know, there, there's uh, electrostatic, there, there's an you know, electro spray, I should say, uh, processes. We, we don't have the resources to do the, the many other methodologies. We really, <laughs> we really don't do anything else. Yep. It's pressure spray and centrifugal wheel and hope to get the two fluid fairly yep. soon. And another thing about, again, in the comments on the, uh, the dextrin, uh, maltodextrin or uh, on the oxidation level, just mm -hmm. something is that, yes, to show that uh, maybe if we use more, but also one factor is really important, especially if you want to have modified starch plus dextrin or maltodextrin is the glass transition temperature use more yes they might uh, uh, prevent oxidation but uh, by decreasing glass transition temperature it becomes more hygroscopic so they absorb moisture and then they prone to more oxidation so there is a sweet point in there, so it's not. I mean, to have more um, dexter, multidextrin is not uh, good. Yeah, no, uh, you can get caking. You can have a number of a number of problems. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Good, good point. Gary Zelda goes inside a comment and a question, please. Comment is for the audience to know that Gary Renexius was elected an honorary member of the Society of Flavor Chemists in the eighties. So it's a pleasure and a privilege that you're here again. Alfred, I got a, I got a nice yeah. jacket for that, and I thought about wearing it for the presentation today, <laughs> but I didn't, so <laughs> thank you. It, it's all what you presented. That was excellent. Thank you. I have a quick yeah. question. Yeah, if, we, question. Yeah. If, we have, um, if we agree that smaller uh, particle size is important for stability, have you looked at microtechnology? Microtechnologies? Where um, we... Okay. Well, I, I don't know if I can comment on that, Alfred, but we do have a microfluidic system, you know, that I just am wanting to do something with um, because I, I like the egg and shell structure. I, I like that core material, not a matrix droplets all over. You can get a pretty thick wall on it very efficiently. But of course, then distribution of products, another story. But I, I just would love to be able to do something with microfluidics and, and spray drying. Um, so I, that wasn't where you were going, but. <laughs> uh, thank you. Okay. Well, good to see you, Alfred. Likewise. <clears throat> I have a question. This is, this is Jeremy Nowak. With some of the leading proteins as emulsifiers, what do you think, do you have any like um, kind of front runners in your opinion that would be viable targets for encapsulating flavors? I know you mentioned like whey, sodium castanate, soy, I think you mentioned kind of pea protein and anecdotally from the current state of the industry, is there a particular protein or kind of functional groups that are looking to be leading, leading the pack in those areas? Or is that still an area of like further research before you can really say something definite? Well, we have a host of new proteins coming up. It, it amazes me all the, the, the foods or plants that are being mined for, for this application. Oh, and, for sure. and, and I think most of them haven't really been looked at well enough. Uh, some are still quibbling over methodology, isolation, purification. Uh, we, we have a, a plant protein innovation center here that has, I think, 27 companies as members. And uh, they're interested in emulsification. 
And so that's part of the work that's being done in this protein center. Here's different proteins. What are the best emulsifiers? What are the best, you know, in, in various applications? So I don't think we have that information right now, but I think that's being collected. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Gary, uh, uh, thanks for giving so much uh, useful information to us. Uh, uh, can you explain us uh, which kind of automizer is suitable for drying uh, uh, orange oil? Uh, is it a disc type or a, a nozzle type? It's more suitable for drying any kind of uh, flavors. You know, Many moons ago, I did a study comparing a nozzle and centrifugal disc, and they, they, they had equal performance. Uh, I, I couldn't find any difference between them or some differences in particle structure, yes, but that didn't translate into different performance of the flavoring material. Now, maybe that should be revisited because that was probably 30 years ago <laughs> that we, we made that comparison, and maybe there's different materials at this point, too. So um, I, I probably can't help you too much at this point, other than we didn't find a difference in the studies we've done between the two types. They both high shear uh, in process. Okay, and uh, uh, the speed of the automizer, does it make difference with the drying? Well, I guess if you're looking at a centrifugal wheel, the, the higher the rotation speed, it'll tend to give you this finer particles. Um, they balance that against throwing it against the wall someplace <laughs> if you feed too fast and, uh, and whirl too fast. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Again, thank you so much, Gary. This was this was great. Well, I enjoy it. Uh, you, you guys are good good to work with. How's that? I I've always enjoyed it. So, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, you bet. No problem. Take care. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Thank you, Gary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, um, let's move over to William and the. Uh, VCF online database. We'll get him lined up and ready to present. Yes. That way he can go over and demonstrate the capabilities of it. Uh. Yes, I'm trying to share my uh, my screen now. Yes. Hello, I'm trying. Yeah, I yeah, I think there we go. I succeeded. I'm sorry about that. That uh, I, I I have an Apple computer and I had to uh, put some uh, made some changes. I didn't realize that. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity for me to share the the VCF online. I'm not I'm not sure whether you're familiar with that, but. The, um, I will explain it to you in the next uh, slide. 
slides or in, in my presentation. Uh, we are based in, in the Netherlands. Um, well, the, um, <clears throat> well, actually, the VCF online is a is an, a database regarding volatile compounds in food, um, and there are the, the the flavors and fragrances that determine the flavor and odor of of of, uh, of food. All the data are being deduced from scientific uh, literature. And the database is mainly used by, uh, by professional flavorists of, of uh, several companies. I will give you an overview later. And you can, can access the, the database by subscription. And it has already a, a quite a long history. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I will open this. Um, well, we, I recently purchased the database. I will explain, explain you later also why. And um, well, we, uh, recently, the last two years, we tried to uh, really get into contact with our customers, but due to Corona, that was quite difficult. But well, we contacted a few, uh, and, and well, the main purpose of the use of this database is actually product development. Um, they are also. It is also being used for the development of new food flavors, for instance, new potato chips flavors or well, um, products which are in the Netherlands and Europe quite popular at this moment are, are uh, beer without without alcohol. And uh, well, if you if you uh, prepare beer without alcohol, you are not allowed to use any fermentation reaction because alcohol is not allowed to be present at any stage of the of the uh, preparation of the beer. So therefore, you have have to add all kinds of flavors, and and well, if you know the flavors from uh, ordinary beer, you can use that knowledge to to do, to develop that product. You can also use it for quality assurance, uh, authenticity work, and to make sure if certain compounds are being present in uh, in natural products. And uh, the, the the database is also able to do food pairing on a molecular level. So compare, for instance, all the compounds which are present in whiskey and in chocolate. Um, well, this is the history. In 1963, uh, TNO, which is a research in institute in the Netherlands, they purchased the DC mesh system. And at that, that, that moment, they, they started to analyze volatile compounds in food. And uh, Dr. Wurman, I'm not sure whether he's familiar with you, but he is uh, known at least in Europe quite well. He, he initiated the volatile compounds in food database. Uh, but, uh, at, at that moment, he worked for the Dutch Research Institute of Applied, Re of Applied Research. And he mainly collected qualitative data at that moment. Well, in 1975, he passed away and he was uh, followed up by Dr. Hen and Henk Maarsen and he became editor. And um, <clears throat> well, in, and then uh, two years later, the, the first edition of a book became available and every five years there became a new, there came a new edition. Uh, in 1983, also quantitative data were added. In 1995, Ben Nijs became editor, and in 2002, uh, an internet edition became available, VCF online. Um, and in 2015, also odor and flavor threshold values were added. And in 2019, we took over the VCF online. Um, oh. Well, this is Dr. Wurman. At that time, he was quite well known in, in flavor in the flavor uh, community. Um, and in 1997, when he passed away, the, the Wurman Flavor Research Symposium conference was created. Uh, one moment, M my neighbors are, because it's quite late here, I'm sorry. Yeah, 
sorry about this, but in Holland it's already six hours later, and and uh, uh, then uh, my neighbor uh, wanted to have something for me, but I uh, said I'm not available now. Um, well, the Wurman Symposium is very uh, well known among uh, um, flavor scientists in in Europe, and it's every every three years it's being organized. Um, and gathering well-known scientists from academia, industry, and from all the disciplines of, uh, of the flavor industry, not only chemistry, but also biology, neurophysiology, <coughs> and uh, psychology. So everything what's uh, important for, for flavor research. Um, oh, yeah. Well, what does the VCF online database contain? Well, um, it has uh, many products, around 900 products. And uh, of all these 900 products, uh, all the known flavor compounds and odor compounds are, are, are available. But it's subdivided in 13 product groups. And you can see here the full list, for instance, alcohol, beverages, etc. Um, well, I think the, the, the subdivision makes quite sense, sensible. And, and between brackets, you can see the number of, uh, of food products which are present in that specific class. So for instance, for fruit, there are 200 different types of fruit which are present in this class. <clears throat> so approximately 900 food products. Um, there are six, well, almost 680 products, which are in 125 cat categories, and there are also 129 single products. Well, categories can, can be, for instance, citrus fruits, which contain, of course, uh, um, uh, <coughs> oranges, um, etc. Um, and you have to realize everything is being deduced from the scientific lit literature. Um, you can see here, um, the product is apple, fresh, Jonathan, which is in the category of fresh apples. Here's some kind of additional info information added. You also have a, a picture. <coughs> and then, um, well, if, if you open this, you get the full list of all the compounds which are um, available in the literature, which are related to this product. Well, in this... Uh, type of, of fresh apples, um, 74 compounds have been identified in five literature references. Now here's the, the full list. And what you also see is the, the quantity range of this product. Uh, for, for instance, for this compound, uh, Pharmacine, uh, the range is 0 0.34 to 2.16 ppm. <clears throat> Well, here are the, if you click then on, on literature references, you find all the literature with, which is related to this, uh, to this food product. Well, there are five literatures. You subsequently, can, you can also click on the blue line on this literature, and then you find all the information, all the compounds which is related to this literature. So it's quite, how do you say that, nuanced. Oh, yes. Um, you have um, approximately, I'm sorry, I can't see the top. Uh, well, uh, you have approximately uh, 9,000 uh, uh, um, compounds. And you have 140,000 occurrences. That means you have 140,000 relations between food products and, and those specific compounds. And the, the following information for each of the compounds when available is added. All kinds of synonyms. Uh, as you know, uh, the chemical names um, can, uh, uh, specific certain chemical compounds can have several names. Also the chemical structure is being given. So the, the, the two-dimensional structure, um, the chemical class to which, which it belongs, belongs, for instance, hydrocarbons, esters, etc. 
information, fish chem information like molecular weight. In the future, we also want to add um, <coughs> an accurate mass molecular weight, which allows it, which allows it to, to uh, faster identify it using high resolution mass spec. But that's typically something for analytical chemists like me. Elemental composi composition. It also gives you older information, such as citrus, green, nut, pungent, etc. It has several uh, hundred dis descriptors. Also, thresholds are available if found in literature. And for approximately 3,000 compounds, threshold values are available. Uh, there, there are 3,000 threshold values available. I will explain that later. And besides that, also some analytical inform chemistry information is available regarding gas chromatographic retention behavior on, on several columns, DB1, 5, 17, and DBREX. In such a way, it gives you retention indices that allows you, if you find a, a specific peak or certain peak in your gas chromatogram, this can support to identify it. Also, it gives chemical, chemical abstract number, the more or less uh, the universal uh, identification of, for, for a certain compound. FEMA grass numbers uh, of the compounds which are generally considered to be safe by the Flavor and uh, Extract Manufacturers Association of the US. And we added all 3,065 compounds, according to the latest update, GRASS29, are being present also in the database, including all the information, including all the links to the scientific literature. The European version of that, 2,600 uh, compounds and some not older um, um, codes for, the, for compounds. If we could found them, we added also this information. Well, the compounds are also subdivided in, in the chemical classes like hydrocarbons, alcohols, etc. And recently I added nucleotides, nucleosides, uh, amino acids, carbohydrates, which of course are also essential, not, not only for the odor, of course, but also for the, for the flavor. And be, between brackets, you see the number of compounds which are available in the database of hydrocarbons, 1182. Um, <clears throat> this is an example, how you, how you can see it in the database. Well, there are 9,900 um, uh, compounds present, for instance, pentadecane, etc., grouped in 22 chemical classes. There are 140,000 occurrences, as we call them. That's the presence of compounds in 900 food products. Uh, 7,500 have synonyms. We have 3,000 flavor thresholds. We have COVAT's retention index, allowing to identify them. I will explain later. And all kinds of information which, which help to, to class classify the compound. For instance, for isobutyl acetate, here you find the, anon, the, the synonyms, the group to, to which it belongs, the cost numbers and all the other numbers. Um, now, in this, this case, we, we again used the, the Apple Fresh, the present in, in Apple Fresh, Jonathan. Well, it's only qualitative available, no real numbers, concentration numbers were found. But you can then also find the, qual the quantity range in product categories of all apples, which is given here. And uh, 12, uh, 12 literature references were found giving this specific range. And the occurrences in all products, that this compound is present in 100 products, at least to the, to the scientific lit literature we found, and ranging from zero to 600 ppm. Again, you can click then to the occurrences of all products, and then you see the full list, including the concentration values of all the product of, of all the of the presence of the specific compounds in all the products. <coughs> well, I said I explained something about retention index. Uh, as an analytical chemist, you can uh, use the retention index, for instance. Um, this, is, this is just an example. This is a GC chromatogram. 
uh, this is uh, a linear uh, carbon uh, chain of, of 17. So it's an alkane of C17, C18, C19. You have to add them as standard standards to your GC system. And, and they are some kind of a marker markers. And when, when a, a specific compound eludes between the 17 and the C18, then it will get an, a, a COVAX retention number between 1700 and 1800, and in this case, uh, 1785. And here you can see, well, uh, I selected a compound with retention index uh, 1735. And in this, this way, can, can, that can help you to identify the, this compound. You can purchase this compound and then also analyze it with GC. And if you have a, a mass spectrometer behind your GC, then you can confirm the presence of this specific uh, compound in your, in your mixture. <clears throat> um, well, so that's also helpful from an analytical perspective. Um, well, here, here again, for this specific compound, you, you have the, all, the, all the information. And here, as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> is the presence of this compound in all the foodstuffs, and for instance, in beef, uh, chestnut, etc. And when available, also the concentration levels are given here. Oh, sorry. And you can click then again on, on beef, and then you get uh, uh, all the, the information of, of beef. <clears throat> um, we also, the, there are also uh, several threshold values available. Um, um, I have to push this away. Yeah, that's better. For instance, for this, this compound, diacetyl, um, the following thresholds are available in, this, in, in, in our database, all linked again to literature. Um, well, there are specific uh, thresholds available. Oh. I don't know. Ah. There, there are thresholds <coughs> available for... Uh, in, for in air, which is given in mi milligrams per cubic meter, uh, in water, <clears throat> uh, in various media. So if you find, for instance, a threshold value, a threshold value, by the way, I think it's, it's obvious for you, but uh, is the amount you require uh, to be present in a certain matrix, in this case, air or water, to, to be noticed by a trained uh, a flavorist. Um, but sometimes they also determined the presence of this specific compound in wine, and then the, you can, uh, uh, well, then they gave the value, the threshold value for this specific compound in wine, and then we also added it to, to our database. There are also flavor thresholds in water, for instance, and in <coughs> various media. Well, here is the full list. You can, and again, click on, uh, on the literature and then get all the relevant information which is linked to this literature. Um, well, this, this is, these are just to give you an overview of the relationships. Ship. Well, there are 900 products in the database and almost 10,000 compounds. And uh, well, those specific compounds are 140,000 times present in all these 900 products. So that's the relationship between them. All is being covered by literature. Um, the analytical data have been verified quite uh, thoroughly. So we really needed to, in, in, the, in the, the data should really show that the, the specific compound is identified by two independent analytical techniques, for instance, with GC, retention time, and the mass spectrum. Um, also, COVAT's retention time indices have been you taken from the literature. And for instance, if you found 100 times uh, a certain COVAT's retention index for a specific compound, 
the, the average is being measured, but you can al also find all the individual values, well, which is also always covered by literature. Um, well, certain specific information uh, which is relevant to find the structures, uh, structures, so the cost numbers, gross numbers, etc., and also of, of, of uh, th more than 3,000 thresholds are available for the compounds, also covered again by literature, by scientific literature. Well, who's using it? Well, we have now 108 subscriptions of flavor companies, food companies, but also universities and also some governments who use it as some kind of safety information. And also they want to know what kind of chemicals are present in, in certain food stuff, stuff. And sometimes we get also questions from, from people who, who want a full list, who want to have the full list of acetamide or acetaldehyde. And then, well, then I, I can uh, make an, an overview of all the, all the compounds, including their levels uh, um, uh, of all the uh, food constituents which have acetaldehyde acet acet present in, uh, in their foodstuffs and also their levels. Well, several of the subscriptors are from Japan, also many from the US, European Union, and also from many uh, different co countries. Well, if <coughs> one subscription of a company means that they can have several users, so there are approximately 3,000 users, and most of them are professional workers in the flavor industry with a scientific background. Now, I can show you some future developments. Um, well, there's, there's a lot of literature uh, present, and I'm, I'm uh, quite scientific, also uh, trained in the pharma industry. So, um, <clears throat> well, recently I started a project to uh, look at all the literature which is, uh, which is available. And, well, that's so much, it, it's hardly possible to do that. And this is also something I really like to do. That, and this is not really, uh, well, it's a little bit profitable to be honest, but um, I, I can't live from it. So it's just something I do besides my, my real job. Um, so we, we can't hire people to do, the, to do all the VCF literature searching. So therefore <clears throat> I'm working together with a friend who, who has a company in artificial intelligence to do the VCF literature searching. I can show you later. And besides that, we, we got uh, the request to uh, construct an essential oil database. I think it, it is called the ESO database because it's already uh, quite old and it's still only available in, in, in older versions of uh, uh, on, on CD-ROMs. And um, well, that, that is also a potential development. <coughs> um, well, to keep up with all the food literature doing manually, and of course you can do a Google search or, or other PubMed searches or in, in other uh, databases, but still it's a, quite a laborious task. Um, well, in 2021, uh, uh, no, in 2020, uh, we identified more than 35,000 publications which appear in the, in the scientific literature, which uh, are regarding food or beverages. Um, well, now we are um, developing an artificial intelligence literature screening tool uh, to search and access all the scientific food, flavor, fragrance, odor literature. <coughs> uh, for instance, well, we did already some pilot searching in, from, for 2000. If, if you look for the mesh food and beverage, you find approximately 35,000 scientific papers. And we defined some classifier, which, which is a, a, yeah, a system which uses artificial intelligence. We trained it also um, by, um, by letting me checking the, the performance of this classifier and, and giving it feedback. Well, after the, uh, a good trained classifier, approximately 2,000 uh, relevant papers were there. And if I checked those in a quite rapid format, approximately 1,500 are useful for the database. 
And also retrospective, we have now approximately 7,000 papers in the database and we found already probably 10 to 15,000 papers are potentially interesting to enter the database. Well, this is then the more or less the workflow. Um, you search scientific literature, PubMed is a possibility, but there are all other databases containing literature. Uh, if you search only for food and beverages, you find 35,000 abstracts. Uh, well, then you, you can classify this abstract with, a, with an artificial intelligence tool. Then approximately 2,200 papers are relevant. Do another selection, and then 1,500 are useful. And then, of course, if you have to, 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 to screen all the 1,500 and, and uh, uh, get the data from those papers and enter them into the database, that's also quite a lot of work. So we also are thinking how to automate this. So you, you, you think this is a paper from 2020 about uh, flavor compounds in soy. There's a list from one to uh, a list of 132. It has re uh, retention indices, it has odor descriptors, and it has compounds. It doesn't have quantitative data, regretfully. But still, uh, I, I analyzed this, this paper and it looks quite good. So they, these data can potentially be entered into the database. <coughs> so there are also um, text mining tools available, which are able, if you train them well, to, to, to abstract, to extract all these data into a, an electronic format, which is able to directly couple to the database, to the, to, the enter, to the entering tool of the database. Of course, you always need to have a, a human check. But that's more or less the idea. <coughs> um, and in that way, well, we hope that we can make this database much more comprehensive, much more complete, and uh, well, much more uh, useful. <clears throat> and well, then the, I, I hope then the fear of missing out will be strongly reduced. We get a much broader coverage in the scientific literature, and we can also offer a much broader coverage of food products, chemical compounds, and threshold values. Um, <clears throat> But also, I heard rumors that it might be interesting to use the same kind of principle as the VCF database for the construction of an essential oil database, because there's something, but that's already quite old, and it's difficult to, uh, to, to, to find compounds in. So <clears throat> it might be an idea to, uh, and using the same search tools, and automation tools and artificial intelligence tools to use um, an essential oil database with a comprehensive database of volatiles and essential oils. Um, it should have the same design as the VCF online database. And uh, well, we have to make use of automated VCF literature screening um, using artificial intelligence. And it should cover aiming for most of the scientific literature which is available. Okay, thank you very much. If, if you have questions, well, you can, can email me and contact me and hopefully I, I can see you live in the near future because I'm cu really curious about face-to-face uh, -face feedback about uh, our ideas, how to proceed with this, uh, this database and this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have questions? And if not, I will, uh, I'll just remind everyone that our next meeting is October 21st in Chicago. It will be in person, and we will also uh, do the membership meeting portion via Zoom also.
and um, that's it for my end. Thank you, William. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And hopefully I see everyone soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks again. Nice to do.